Are you interested in using social media data for your research? My name is Johannes Breuer. I'm a senior researcher at GESIS, Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences, and I want to talk to you about how you can combine surveys and social media data to answer your research questions. In this video, I want to talk to you about what social media data is, how you can collect it, what data linking is, and why it can be useful to link social media data and surveys. After that, I want to discuss some uh, use cases for linking surveys and social media data. And finally, I want to discuss some of the key challenges in the process of linking surveys and social media data. First off, let's define what social media data is. Essentially, it's any data generated by users on platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Reddit. It's quite difficult to give a more specific definition as these platforms differ uh, based on the types of interactions they allow and accordingly they also produce different types of data. Uh, it's easier to think of examples of social media data that you can collect. For Facebook, these could be posts or photos, uh, profile information from users. For Twitter, these could be your tweets or retweets and replies. Of course, again, profile information. And for YouTube, these could be channel statistics or video statistics or viewer comments. Usually the unit of analysis in the social sciences is the individual user, but if you use something like um, YouTube video statistics, then your unit of analysis would be the video or the channel that you're looking at. Most times people work with textual data, uh, but it could also be audio, video, or images used for the analyses. Why would you want to collect social media data? Social media use has become part of everyday life for a lot of people, and this use generates a lot of data. Um, much of this data is also interesting for social science research um, and can be used to answer interesting research questions. How can you collect social media data? Basically, there are three ways. You can collect the data yourself. You can enter into direct corporations with the platforms that provide these services. Or you can buy data from resellers or market research companies. Of course, each of these options has its own pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages. Um, and essentially, your choice of method should depend on the type of data you need to answer your research question and also the resources that you have available, such as time, money, or skills for the data collection. In a paper that's upcoming by Libby Bishop, Katarina Kinderkulana, and me, that will be published in New Media and Society soon, we'll discuss these options in more detail and also address some of the ethical and practical challenges in collecting social media data or digital behavioral data through public-private partnerships. The first option that I want to discuss is collecting social media data yourself. As a side note, if you want to collect social media data yourself, a good go-to resource is the Social Media Lab at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada, as they provide many good resources that are relevant if you want to collect social media data yourself. Again, there are basically three options for collecting social media data yourself. You can use application programming interfaces or APIs that the platforms provide. You can collect data through web scraping, or you can go directly through the users to collect your data. And in the following, I'll briefly explain each of these options and what they mean. So the first option for collecting social media data yourself that I want to discuss are application program interfaces or APIs. Um, their main advantages are that most of the platforms provide these. Um, they usually have good documentation, and there are packages or tools available for interfacing with them, for example, packages or libraries for Python and R. Um, and the data that you get out of APIs is usually structured. Um, some major disadvantages, however, are that these APIs can be changed by the companies that provide them at any time. They can be limited or even entirely closed off, as the key example that probably most people know is um, the clo closing of the Graph API by Facebook after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, and also, APIs typically have limits on the quantity or type of requests that you can send through them. There's recently been an exchange on um, what changes in APIs mean for research between Axel Bunz and Cornelius Puschmann in the journal Information, Communication, and Society. That might be interesting for you. And uh, Dean Freeland also recently published an opinion piece where he speaks of a post-API age and what that means for research that APIs can be changed or closed off entirely. That might be interesting if you want to work with APIs. The next option that I want to discuss is web scraping. Um, it's more flexible than the use of APIs, and it doesn't depend on the goodwill of companies that provide APIs. However, it's more difficult and more involved. It's also not as easy to learn and pick up as the usage of APIs. 
the data that you get from web scraping is unstructured and changes in website structure can be an issue for your methods. Also, web scraping can be a bit of a legal gray zone. At the very least, it's quite likely that you might violate terms of services of websites if you engage in web scraping. However, Dean Freeland in the discussion paper that I just mentioned argues that it's important for researchers to know and learn web scraping uh, because APIs can be changed and closed at any time and it's not a good idea to fully rely on APIs for your research or only rely on APIs for your research. The third option is getting the data directly from the users, which has also been called data donation. Most social media platforms provide the option for users to download their own data. Many of these have been implemented in the wake or as a reaction to the new general data protection regulation, which have been put into place in Europe. And users can then decide to share this data that they exported with researchers. Um, another option is using something like a browser plugin to collect data. The key advantages of directly going through the users is that you have immediate informed consent, that it's transparent for the users what data they provide for the research project, and that you don't have any issues with something like rate limits or terms of services. The main disadvantage of this approach is that it might not be easy to implement. You might have to instruct users how to upload the data or how to use the browser plugin that you want to use for your data collection. There's a recent paper by Alexander Halavays in which he proposes data from the users as a solution for what he calls overcoming terms of services. There's also a new study by Kirsten Torsen and colleagues where they use this approach to study exposure to news and politics on Facebook with a student sample. After discussing what social media data is and how you can collect it, the next thing that I want to talk about is what data linking is. Essentially, data linking means to combine any source of data with another source of data for the same unit of analysis. In social sciences, these would usually be individual or respondents or participants. There are different terms in the literature that you can find. One is data linking, the other is record linkage or also data linkage. Um, there are two types of linkage in the literature. Uh, one is probabilistic and the other is deterministic. In this video and in the examples I'm going to use, I'm going to focus on deterministic linking, which means you have a unique identifier or a set, a combination of identifiers that you can use to match individuals uh, or units of analysis, more generally speaking, in the different types of data that you combine. In the quantitative social sciences, it's usually surveys plus X. So in our case, it would be linking surveys with social media data. What do you want to link surveys and social media data? Surveys are self-report data, and self-report data can be biased in many ways. For example, by social desirability. Um, you can also have something like recall bias. If you ask people, for example, about their media use, so you probably get a reliable answer if you ask people how many times they checked their phone or used Facebook yesterday, but it's likely going to be different if you ask people how many times on an average day or even in an average week they use Facebook. If you use social media data alone, you might be missing important features in your data, such as information about the people whose data you collect, um, attitudes or personality. Or another thing that can be missing are important outcome variables. So if you're looking into political behavior and political communication, you usually don't get voting behavior with social media data. That's why it makes sense to combine these two data types to overcome the limitations of these. Um, in a special issue of Social Science Computer Review that I guest edited together with Kirsten Torsen, Sebastian Stier, and Pascal Siegers, we wrote an introduction where we discuss some of the reasons for linking social media data and survey data in more depth. After having established why you would want to link social media data and surveys, uh, let's talk about how you can link social media data and surveys. Essentially, there are four ways um, based on two dimensions for linking surveys and social media data. One is time, so when is the data collected? You can do ex ante linking, which means that the data are collected at the same time. Or you can do ex post linking, which means the data already exist independent, have been collected independent of one another, and then you do the linking later on. And the other question is on what level are the data linked? You can do linking on an aggregate level for a group of people or for a time period, for example, or for a specific geography. Or you can do linking at the individual level, which usually means at the level of the individual, individual respondent or user. Um, this is more common and also more interesting for the social sciences. Uh, again, in the introduction to that special issue that I just mentioned, we discussed this typology of linking in more depth and also provide some examples where this has been used in the literature. What are some of the use cases of linking surveys and social media data? In the special issue in Social Science Computer Review that I mentioned, we have several papers that did this to answer different research questions. You can, an you can answer methodological questions 
for example, regarding over or under reporting in surveys. Uh, Henshin did this in the special issue, and she used the combination of survey and Facebook data to measure political activity on the platform. You can also research political attitudes and opinions. Pasek and colleagues in that special issue used data from polls and Twitter to assess attitudes towards US presidents. Of course, there are many other application areas for combined survey and social media data. You can use it to study media use, social networks, or well-being, for example. Working with linked survey and social media data poses its own challenges for each phase of the research data lifecycle. In the following, I'll discuss some of the key challenges. The first challenge is recruiting participants. You have two options. You can start from the social media data and then use the social media to recruit people for your survey. Or you can collect the survey data first and then ask for consent to also collect social media data for your respondents. Again, each of these options has its own pros and cons. How you recruit your participants and what method you use to collect social media data affects the composition of your sample and, of course, might also introduce different biases. For example, if you recruit via Twitter, your population of interest should be Twitter users and not the general population. Ultimately, your choices should again depend on your specific research question. Another challenge is getting informed consent. It's important to collect informed consent when you link surveys and social media data. You need to make clear what data you collect, why you collect it, and how it will be used and stored. You should also mention data sharing if you plan to make your data available for other researchers. The paper by Al Bagal and colleagues in the Social Science Computer Review Special Issue provides a good template. In their study, they linked different surveys with Twitter data. They first provided the short informed consent with important basic information in the survey, and then an extended privacy information that was optional to read for participants. Of course, you also need to think about privacy and data protection. It's important to protect participant privacy in linked survey and social media data if you want to share the data, especially if you study sensitive topics and or at-risk populations. Apart from removing direct identifiers such as names and posts, you should also try to keep the indirect identifiers that could be used in combination to re-identify participants at a minimum. You also need to pay special attention to the privacy of people who did not consent to their data being used in your study, such as people, Facebook friends being tagged in posts. There are some helpful resources for sharing social media data that can also be used as a guidance for dealing with linked survey and social media data. You're going to find the references to that in the video description. So in this video, we've covered what is social media data, how can you collect it, what is data linking, and why can it be useful to link surveys and social media data. I've presented some use cases for linking surveys and social media data, and finally discussed some of the key challenges in the process of linking surveys and social media data. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this interesting. If you want to learn more about the topic, be sure to check out the references in the video description below. This video is produced by the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. For more information on CESTA, please visit www.cesta.eu.